first paragraph says, Jesus' mission on earth was finished. God soon would send the Holy Spirit, who, ratifying their efforts with many signs and wonders, would empower and lead the disciples on a mission that would reach the ends of the earth. Jesus could not stay with them forever in human flesh. Not only did his incarnation impose upon him a physical limitation in the context of a worldwide mission, but his ascension and exaltation in heaven were necessary in order for the Spirit to come. When Jesus' mission on earth was finished, was Jesus' mission to save humanity and eliminate sin from the universe finished? No. Was the atonement complete at the cross? For, for those who don't know, this is a big argument in Christianity, whether this was a complete atonement or an incomplete atonement. This is magic words for many people. It's a complete atonement. They want to believe in a complete atonement. It was completed. The primary view in Christianity is, in the Protestant world, is the atonement was complete at the cross. And of course, the confusion is rooted in, as almost all the confusion is rooted in, the imposed law construct. Once you accept the imposed law construct rather than God's design law, then it all becomes very confusing because once you have the imposed law construct, atonement has some legal elements to it. When you realize it's design law and that sin is a problem of our actual condition, we realize atonement was providing what was necessary to restore us back into unity or oneness with God to fix what sin did to us at one minute. But in the legal model, it was in the legal model that Martin Luther developed his idea of penal substitution. Why? Because he wanted to take away the power of the church to manipulate people with the doctrine of purgatory. You see, under the, the model at the time that Martin Luther lived, um, purgatory is the idea that once you die, if you haven't taken care of all your sinfulness yet, then you can go to a place called purgatory where the sins can be purged, pur purging a tory, purgatory, purging out the sins. And if you spend your time there, then the sins can be purged and you can eventually go on to heaven. And this was used by the organization because the organization held the keys to heaven and hell and thus the priests and so forth would come to the people and say if you donate this much money or you donate this land or you send three of your sons off to the crusades or you do this then we will give so many extra credits to your dead grandfather in purgatory and send them on to heaven for you. And you can see how manipulative this was of the people and Martin Luther recognized it as a heresy and so he wanted to take the power away from the church to use this. And how did he do it? He came up and he created the idea of something called penal substitution theology. And penal substitution theology is that all sins, past, present, and future, of all people, of all time, from Adam all the way to the last human on earth, were placed upon Christ at the cross, and the Father punished all the sins on Jesus there, and thus there's no sins left for anybody to be purged in purgatory, because they've already been taken care of, a complete atonement at the cross. That's, that's where this all came from. The problem, of course, is that this entire construct is based on a lie. A false diagnosis. That the sin problem is legal. That God's law functions like human laws. That God is the source of inflicted pain. That justice is God using his power to kill sinners who don't get a legal accounting for their sins. It's all false. It's Satan's view. It's paganism. The truth is that God's law is design law and mankind's sin. Our condition became terminal. We're dead in trespass and sin. We're out of harmony with God and his design for life. Thus, notice scripture. I'm going to quote you out of 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is substitution. But notice, this is not penal substitution. This is healing substitution. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that's substituting us, so that we might become righteous. We might be healed. We might be restored. Not that we might be declared righteous. We might become the righteousness of God. This is the view, in this view, we understand that the perfect and complete remedy for sin was procured by Christ at the cross. But the remedy still needs to be applied in the hearts and minds of individual believers. Thus the species human was saved in the person, the humanity of Jesus Christ. He picked up humanity, broken off and damaged by Adam, becoming human, and he carried humanity to perfection in his own journey. He becomes the second Adam. And now, because of Jesus, the species human has been perfected and saved. 
and he created or achieved what was necessary for individual salvation, but that requires all of our participation. We must partake of what Christ has provided. And thus the atonement was not complete at the cross. The remedy was complete at the cross, but the application of the remedy into each believer is ongoing. So this is out of a book called Desire of Ages. See if you agree or disagree. In describing, his, in describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been to no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to the satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but with the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all heredity, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to oppress, impress his own character upon his church. Do you agree or disagree? So this is... Do you notice the healing model aspects described here? Christ came and achieved what was necessary, but now, which is remedy, but now we have to participate, and you put the metaphors of Scripture in there, it fits perfectly. We get a new heart and right spirit. We're born again. We have the heart of stone removed, we have the heart of, heart of flesh put in. We have circumcision by the heart of the Holy Spirit. We get the mind of Christ. The old man dies, the new man lives. We become partakers of the divine nature. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. How do all these metaphors become reality? Through the indwelling Holy Spirit who takes the achievements of Christ. And so Christ said, it's expedient for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the comforter won't come. When the comforter comes, he's not going to speak on his own. He speaks only what he hears. And he's going to take what's mine. He's going to make it known to you. And what's he taking? He's taking the perfection of human character that Christ wrought out, and he's reproducing it in us so we get new desires, new motives, new longings. The things of the world become repulsive to us. We, we, find, we find that, that selfishness and, and perversion is, is disgusting and, and, and it's not appealing to us as our hearts are being changed. And do you see how the design law aspect and view harmonizes it all? 